Hello. Today I'm going to read from Saving Winslow, written by Sharon Creech, published by Scholastic Incorporated. I will read chapters one through six. Chapter one. What is it? In the laundry basket on the kitchen floor was a lump. Another dead thing, Louis asked. Not yet, said the father. It was the midst of winter when night, like an unwelcome guest, came too early and stayed too long, and when each day seemed smaller than the one before. Louis's mother stared down at the basket that her husband had brought into the house. Another one of Uncle Pete's, I presume. Uncle Pete had a small farm on the outskirts of town. Anything to do with Uncle Pete usually involved Louis's father wasting time or money or doing something dangerous like chopping down trees or racing tractors through mud fields or disposing of dead animals. Louis's father had already brought home and buried two piglets that had not survived their birth. Louis knelt beside the basket, a small gray head with black eyes and feathery eyelashes and sticking up ears emerged. Attached to the head was a trembling, thin body and four long, spindly legs, all of it covered in splotchy gray fur scattered with brown feathers. It was not a dog or a cat. It was a pitiful-looking thing, and it was gazing at Louis. He felt a sudden rush, as if the roof had peeled off the house and the sun had dived into every corner of the kitchen. A goat? he asked, kneeling beside the basket. No, a donkey, his father said. A mini donkey born last night. A mini donkey? Louis' hand cupped the donkey's head, patting it gently. The donkey seemed too weak to move. Something's wrong with it? The mother is sick and can't take care of it. Poor mama, Louis said. Poor baby, what'll happen to it? Probably go downhill fast. Might last a day or two. No. So, his mother said, why do you have a donkey? Why did you bring it home if it might just die in a day or two? I don't know, his father said. I felt sorry for it. Thought maybe we could at least watch it until, you know, until it dies. He whispered that last word. The donkey made a small noise that sounded like, please. Louis lifted the donkey from the basket and held it close. Close. It smelled of wet hay. He put his face against Louis's neck and made that noise again. Please. Okay, Louis said. I accept the mission. What mission? To save this pitiful, motherless donkey. Chapter 2. Something Different Approaching. Louis's house was old and cold and drafty and leaky, rising up out of its stone cellar, cellar with good intention, but weakening as it reached the bowed roof hopping the musty attic. The house was like many others on the narrow sides of this side of town, roads of this side. Beyond the town stretched farmland and empty fields. In summers past, the house had felt light and airy, cooling breezes puffing the curtains out, in and out of the windows, and always was older brother Gus there, so full of energy and purpose. Come on, Louis, let's paint the porch. And come on, Louis, let's clean out that vegetable patch. Come on, Louis, let's go to the creek. I was with something new to do. But now Gus was in the army, gone already a year. And now it was winter. And each day short and dark and cold. Until this snowy Saturday morning in January, with the wind plastering the windows with wet flakes, when Louis had awakened, feeling floaty, suspended in the air with something different approaching. Chapter 3 don't let it hear you. Louis had not had the best luck nurturing small creatures. Those worms he brought into the house when he was three years old, those cute, wiggly things dried up and died two days later. The lightning bug, so carefully caught and tipped into the glass jar with holes punched in the lid, dead at the bottom of the jar three days later. The lively goldfish won at the carnival, belly up at the end of the week. Blue Carakee, Parakee also went at the carnival, carefully fed and watered and talked to. Three months, 
then gasps its last breath at the bottom of its cage. The kitten found at the side of the road, ran away the second day. A bird, limp, limping across the porch and gently brought indoors, flew out an open window two days later. Hamster, snake, turtle, lizard, we tried, but all of them, each one and every one, either shrivel up and died or escape. More recently, he had been longing for a dog. His parents thought it would be a better idea if he borrowed a dog from time to time, one that didn't live with them, one that didn't need walking in the rain or snow, and one that didn't pee in the carpet or chew on the furniture. So Louis was more than a little surprised when his father came home on Saturday morning with a pitiful donkey wrapped in a blue blanket. I don't want to watch it die, his mother said. No, Louis said, no dying. I told you I accept the mission. The pitiful creature tentatively touched its nose to Louis. Ah, oh. don't get attached, his mother warned. If you're going to be heartbroken when it shh, Louis said, don't let it hear you. He asked if it, he asked his father if it was a boy or a girl. It's a boy, he said, poor thing. His parents stepped out onto the porch to discuss the situation. Louis could see his mother waving her arms here and there and his father nodding helplessly, shrugging his shoulders as if he realized he had not thought this through. And then Louis saw him waving his arms and smiling and making a cute donkey face. The pitiful donkey was trembling in Louis's arms, his wee head nuzzling Louis's neck, his long spindle legs folded up awkwardly. By the time his parents came inside, Louis had a plan. He'll stay in the cellar. I can sleep there with him on the cot. Maybe we could have a, the heater on at night. We need to go to the feed store and get some hay for him to sleep on in a bottle and some work milk for him. His mother's mouth opened and shut. No sound came. Mom, will you watch him while Dad and I get supplies? Louie handed the donkey to her, pushing him gently into her reluctant arm. Louie's mother bent her head to the donkey, studying his sweet face. Go on, she said, but I'm warning you both. He may not last the night, and if he does, he may not last another day or two. You're going to be so, so sad. No, Louis said. I will say Winslow. Winslow? Mom said. That's his name, Winslow. It just came to me out of the air. Chapter 4. Think Positive. Next door lived Louis's friend, Mac. His father owned the feed store. Louis had been in the feed store many times, helping Mac stock shelves, so he was familiar with the layout. He could direct customers to cow halters, to livestock feed bins, portable cages and tick repellent, and vitamin supplements for animals of all types, and to books on every farm animal, from pigs to donkeys. Mac was there when Louis and his father arrived. They told him about the donkey and chose a suitable powdered milk for him. A small bag, Louis' father said, because it probably won't live there. Yes, it will, Louis said. Don't say that. Mac recommended the book, all about donkeys. But Louis' father said they should get it from the library, because, you know, what will we need it for if the donkey, um, if it, don't say it, think positive. That's pretty much how it was with the few items his father accepted. The smallest bottle, the smallest bag of formula, the tiniest vial of vitamins, the two-page free pamphlet titled The Newborn Donkey instead of the 200-page book all about donkeys. Because he was convinced this would all be wasted on the pitiful donkey. His father did not want to buy a bale of hay for bedding, but Mac's dad offered to throw in the partial bale for free because it had fallen off someone's truck. We're going to feel pretty stupid, his father said, if we get home and find a dead donkey. Quit saying that. I just don't want you to get your hopes up. Chapter 5. Mac and the Sisters. Mac was 13, three years older than Lou. People sometimes thought they were related because they were often together and both had dark, unruly hair and dark eyes and were tall and thin. Louis' own brother, Gus, shared Louis' dark features, but had her fa their father's strong, stocky build. He had played football in high school and had been eager to join the army. 
flu, he missed him. He sometimes missed Mac, too, because lately Mac had been hanging out with his friends from school when he wasn't helping at the feed school. If Louis suggested sledding downhill at the end of the road, Mac sometimes said, Oh, I'm a teenager now. I don't feel like sledding. But other times, if there's no one else around, he might join Louis and laugh his head off all the way down the hill. It was while they were sledding that they met the sisters, Claudine and Nora, who had recently moved to town and were the only other ones on the hill that day. It was late Sunday afternoon, and the snow was packed and icy in spots. Later, Louis couldn't remember how it was that he and Mac learned their names and where they lived and what, that Claudine was Mac's age, and Nora was a year younger than Louis. It was all a blur. The way Mac and Claudine started talking and laughing while Nora and Louis kept on sledding down the hill, walking back up and sledding down again. On the way home, just the two of them, Louis and Mac, Mac put his hand over his heart and said, I'm in love. Tend to stagger and fall back in the snow. Chapter 6 Donkey, donkey, it's okay. When Louis and his father returned from the feed store, his mother was still cuddling the donkey, snuggling him in a blanket, stroking his head, and talking to him. Donkey, donkey, it's okay. Louis set up a place for Winslow in the cellar, with hay for bedding and blankets for extra warm. Winslow was bleeding pitifully, those little please, 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 please. Winslow did not know what to do with the bottle. He repeatedly bumped his nose against the nipple, and when, when he got it in his mouth, he spit it out. When it finally stayed in his mouth, he didn't know how to suck on it. Louis stayed with Winslow, holding him, talking with him, petting him, coaxing him to drink. He dipped milk onto his finger and slipped his finger into Winslow's mouth. Winslow sucked on it eagerly. When Louis repeated that until Winslow accepted the bottle. Success! But it had taken two hours to coax an ounce of milk into Winslow. And then Winslow fell asleep. Louis too fell asleep, holding the blanket, wrapped pitifully Winslow. When Louis was born, he was two months early and weighed only three pounds. He didn't like to see photos of himself from when he was such a scrawny bird-like thing hooked up to tubes and housed in an incubator. He looked helpless. Sometimes Louis thought that he could remember those early days. He knew that was unlikely, but often when he was falling asleep or waking up, he felt as if he'd been gasping for breath. And then suddenly his mouth opened wide and a rush of cool, clean air came in, and he expanded like a balloon, floated up and out of the incubator and into the world. And such a world it was, full of blue sky and trees, heavy with leaves, every shade of green, and birds swooping and diving and chirping and yellow tulips waving. Louis was thinking about this when he fell asleep holding the pitiful donkey. And when he woke a few hours later, he felt that rush of cool, clean air, but something was different. He didn't feel floaty. There was the donkey, limp against his chest. Louis rubbed him with the blanket, begging Winslow to stay alive. Please, please. Winslow's legs twitched. His eyes opened briefly and then closed again. Louis urged the donkey to take more milk. Please, Winslow, please. And he wondered, had his parents begged him to stay alive? Did they hover over him like he was hovering over Winslow? Did they urge him to keep breathing? Did they pat him and talk to him, and did that help him? In two weeks, winter break would be over, and Louis would have to return to school. He hadn't thought about that, about what he would do with Winslow when that time came. How would he fre get frequent feedings? His mother said, oh, don't worry about that. We don't even know if Winslow will be. Don't say it, 